um, one of the an activity that I've um, really come to love and be a part of my life over the last now it's coming on maybe 10 or 12 years is um, carving wooden spoons. Uh, something I learned from some folks in Vermont while I was teaching meditation at a, a place out there called the Center for Whole Communities. And um, it's become a really important practice for me in my life and uh, something about learning a skill, learning something practical, learning how to um, do something with my hands uh, that was creative, um, but manageable also in size in terms of a project. Uh, was something that's really been a, like fulfilling for me in terms of the activity, but also in the, the action of giving them part of the ethic of our um, not so long lineage is to, to not sell any spoon you make, but really just to um, either use it or give it away. And so it's um, when I have time to actually carve and, and make spoons, it's uh, become a, just a really important part of my connection with a lot of people, um, especially if they have kids and I can make little baby spoons for their little ones and um, these beings who I don't know yet. So coming coming home, um, during all this, you know, time and knowing that I was going to be home for a long time, longer than usual, without having to travel to teach, I, I sort of had this idea that I'd have all this time to carve a bunch of spoons. Um, that hasn't really panned out. <laughs> I think it's like, you know, we can often have this sense of like, wow, if you had all the time you wanted, here are all these things you would do instead of work or instead of you know your other responsibilities. Um, but I think what one can find and what I found is actually even just trying to do all the things I think I love is actually quite stressful. There's there's too many of them and they don't actually fit in the same day. And, um, and that's very humbling really to have that experience of like, oh, these are the things I think of as rewarding and fulfilling and uh, energizing for me, you know, not so depleting, but, but actually trying to do them created a lot of uh, anxiety. I mentioned that first uh, monastery of Thich Nhat Hans up in Vermont that I went to for my first couple kind of retreat periods. And I remember there I was sketching something at some point and there was a younger monk who was talking about how he used to also do a lot of sketching and and I asked him if he still did, and he just said, no, you know, I just, I can't remember the exact phrases he used, but just as a monk, it just didn't feel appropriate, or since he, since he ordained, he wasn't doing it. And I, I don't know what I imagined why that was, but I remember feeling like some pain around that. I'm like, oh, like, you're not supposed to do it, or, uh, you know, something felt off about it. But I think at this point in my practice in life, I, I can understand that actually, all of these, um, all of these things we actually do that might look like fulfillment or feel like fulfillment, actually can just create a lot of stress and pressure too. And um, how powerful is it to also like let go of in that that healthy flavor of renunciation of just being careful of like even the things that bring us enjoyment, bring us pleasure. What is the mental? What are the mental qualities that they um, cultivate? But in doing so, you know, I think uh, I have had a little time, you know, and um, it's always amazing to me. This There's something so um, kind of polarized, dichotomous about the process that, you know, you talk about wooden spoons and there's, not, there's it's like, there's a, almost an immediate from really so many different cultural backgrounds, people like a warmth in the heart of like, oh, there's something nice about that. It's nourishing, it's homemade, it's about cooking and feeding and the home. And um, there's something about that that I think we all value and, and long for. But the, the paradox or paradoxical kind of energy is that it's also very clear that you can't make a spoon with a spoon. You need a knife to make a spoon. You actually need like axes and saws and uh, 
froze and all kinds of like very sharp, very, you know, uh, objects that have almost the exact opposite emotional qualities than the spoon itself. And uh, that that can be uh, disorienting. And I'd say actually part of, the, part of the inhibiting factor of learning something like this, where so many of us, when we come and excited and, and now that I teach spoon carving in various places, it's like people want to be able to do that, but they also were afraid of the tools, right? We don't know how to use them. And, and these sharp objects are intimidating, you know, especially w w not having the training um, in this kind of modern world, how to use a lot of tools for many of us. And so that sense of really understanding that actually it takes this precision, this sharpness, um, the strength and clarity, um, and almost a destructive power to be able to create something very beautiful, very nourishing, um, has been an important lesson uh, for me internally. And I think it, it does correlate a lot to our practice, you know, that, that we, we long for minds that are like supple and open and receptive and gentle and tender. And when we're asked to do a practice that has a lot of precision of, of noting the rising and falling of, 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 of you know, more and more sort of minute sensitivity, um, it can feel sort of contradictory. We, you know, we didn't, we didn't come to the practice to kind of get more uptight, more harsh, more hard. Um, it's like we want the looseness. But there is this, ultimately, this question of like, can we actually create this heart mind? You know, can we carve this bowl of, of the heart um, without these tools? You know, can you actually make this generous, open, receptive um, container of the mind without these precise tools? And I think that um, we have a lot of confidence in, in the notion that you can't, it's not the only tools you need, right? There are also lots of qualities of gentleness and tenderness and things that we're trying to create in the process, but um, that there is a reason why we're bringing this clarity to, to each moment, trying to see as clearly as what's happening and as precisely and um, over and over and over and over and over again um, through, you know, through the material of our lives. And in that way, you know, there is a way really where um, I recently learned a, a fun Irish proverb that it's never a delay to stop and sharpen your scythe, right? Your, um, the, your machete or the thing you're, you know, you're harvesting with. And I think that's a, it's such an important truth for any work that we're doing uh, where it's like, it seems like actually to stop and sharpen might just like, oh, it's not worth it. We'll just keep going no matter how dull the knife, the blade gets. But to really understand that actually to stop and sharpen the blade um, is safer. It makes the work faster. It makes it easier um, and uh, less frustrating. And that's true. It's the spoons as well. It's like if, if you're carving with a dull knife, it's, uh, it's slower. It's more frustrating. You're actually developing all these unwholesome qualities in the process, right? And the spoon isn't getting made. And then it's actually more dangerous. You're more likely to slip off, right? The, the, the mind doesn't have the mind, the knife doesn't have the precision to kind of cut in and move um, in a useful way. And, and that this is true for us in our practice, that it's never a delay to stop and sharpen the blade of the mind. Um, and in fact, you could almost look at our entire meditation experience and really our entire lives as, as just sharpening the knife, right? That, that actually the, the using of the attention uh, with this precise quality over time is really just sharpening it uh, over and over and over again um, against the, the grit of our lives. And that can feel very monotonous. You know, I mean, I think that especially where, you know, talking to yogis, people are in these very powerful places of, 
of really being yogis, right? Really being getting quiet and having, you know, really profound subtlety and sensitivity of mind. And yet it's that experience is happening with often very mundane things, right? The chores, the, you know, constant punctuation of our retreats through whatever, maybe it's an email or the doorbell rings or someone needs our attention somewhere. Like this sense of like, it's not just all this refined deva realm things that we're, you know, kind of moving against. It's like, oh, it's the grit, it's the grit, it's the grit. And that that is the practice of sharpening a knife, right? You start with the, um, you know, uh, lowest grit, the most, you know, the most coarse uh, sharpening stones. And then you move slowly to more refined and then just dropping, you know, and uh, it's as Steve was describing yesterday, the um, the foundations of mindfulness. There's the Buddha really ex kind of walks us through this very similar process of um, sharpening the attention from the sort of most um, uh, gritty, most tangible to the most or to the more and more and more refined. So starting with the body, moving to Vedana, sense experience, uh, pleasure on pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, to the um, just the mind, and then to dhammas, which you know has different ways people hold it, but often it's it's composed of these lists that that really start to start to demonstrate how all of these phenomena are related. How, how do different mind qualities lead to other mind qualities? How do certain experiences in the body lead to certain experiences in the mind? How do certain experiences in the body, mind lead to certain experiences in the body? And this sense of body, Vedana, mind, how are they interrelating to form the sense of self and um, either the path to liberation or the path towards more confusion, more imprisonment. And so we we can recognize that it's like, oh, the, the tangible, the physicality as this, just like the kind of, yeah, this low grit of just kind of grinding the attention, you know, <laughs> with sometimes the breath at least is like a little lighter, a little more refined. But of course, we have all these other parts of the body that are, that are going to draw the attention, less refined, more difficult, you know, more coarse. And to understand that this isn't about uh, just attaining you know some certain experience of the body that is the way we think we should or that's like a that that what we think of a liberated experience of physicality or of no pain but rather just this sharpening of the attention by going through over and over again um this very coarse grit of body of physicality and can we can we not think of it as like oh uh, you know, a delay that it's in the way of what we're really trying to get at versus like, this is it. It is never a delay to stop and sharpen the blade, right? It's never a delay to stop and feel the rising and falling and the pressure and the coarseness and the harshness and the heart, you know, whatever it is that we're feeling. And then as, as we, you know, get more clear as the as the attention gets more refined yes then we can notice more subtlety of oh the pleasant unpleasant neutral quality of these things of uh the action of the mind which is you know so ethereal and so fast and so hard to keep track of right it's it's so powerful and yet it's it's so intangible and how confusing that is and actually how precise and um uh sharp and dexterous and uh, agile right? Not just hard and heavy, but how agile the mind needs to be to be able to keep up with mind, to be able to observe mind. And then that next level of, oh, how are these things related? Where is mind creating mind? Where is mind creating body? Where is body creating mind? How are, how are all these things unfolding to observe? There's a, um, many of you know, or maybe all of you that, you know, the Vipassana Hawaii, we, we own some land up in um, the northern part of this island, Kohala, um, that we've really been stewards for, for a long time. Before my uh, time with this uh, beautiful group of people, 
and it has been another powerful thing to be able to be home longer and you know it's always like this taking care of the land and just dealing with the many things that we have to deal with and be responsible for and feel like we're doing in a good way um, in the midst of travel and going back to the mainland. So to be able to really be here and trying to go out, you know, every Monday and uh, in particular now care for this um, lo'i, which is this ancient um, system of terraces that were built for taro cultivation. Um, you know, up to a thousand years ago um, by the very early Hawaiians. And um, it's an incredible, it's just this incredible place of, of such potent spiritual, cultural, um, historical value. Um, and it's something that we've been very careful to um, not try to make any improvements on, or make any changes on in ways that didn't feel in alignment with um, our own goals, with our relationships with the community, with what feels kind of pono, uh, you know, good, right, in terms of our responsibilities as stewards of a piece of land and this, this island. Um, but it, this lo'i is also a place that has, especially now that there aren't cows on the land, that has started to become very overgrown. Um, you know, lots of different weeds and, you know, the pigs are still out there. So they'll drop macadamia nut seeds and there's a huge macadamia nut tree. And, you know, there's, there's things that are more or less potentially destructive and things that really do need to go. So we've made that decision to start just doing some very light weeding, you know, we're not moving any stones, we're not rebuilding, you know, that's gonna take other relationships, other um, protocols, you know, that feel like will need to be in place before that work happens. But that sense of like, if we don't stop this movement of weeds um, soon, then it's going to be impossible to get back. And, and the, the amount of force needed to bring this land back into health will, um, you know, require more gasoline. Uh, and so at the, the level to which it's still around hand tools feels like a time to still go back. So this process of, um, of going out there and cutting, you know, and, um, Michelle and I have been, you know, out there a, a number of times in the last few months and um, just how important it is to have a good tool. You know, I've had this crummy machete that I finally just destroyed uh, on all these rocks, but I, um, I've bought a new one, a better one. And actually I have a, it's an old, um, I think it was Steve's, Steve, your dad's, one of your dad's old tools that were out here. Um, that needs some sharpening, needs a new handle, but it's a little, pr another project I have of like, that'd be great to bring this machete back to life because it's, you know, good old steel, heavy. Um, and the sense of, of the truth of what these, these energies that it takes to be able to care for this piece of land, to, to make sure that it isn't overrun with these destructive forces, these destructive elements. And the energy it takes, you know, the, the, the physical energy, the psychic energy, the determination, the patience, you know, because we're not going out there every day and we're not overdoing it. And it's, there's something very much that as we're doing it reminds me of being a yogi, of just this slow, dedicated time where it's like we're not measuring in terms of uh, some of the standard measurements that we might in our lives but it's like are we doing it in a good way are we being thoughtful are we being careful are we not trying to be so destructive but um really just remove what needs to be removed so that the place isn't harmed so that the the life can come back in a, in a healthy way and to really know that there is this part that we we have in our own hearts that are again like this you know that that there is this cutting this 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 action of um being so careful with the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion. You know, I mean, there's a number of folks I've talked to recently of, 
it's like, oh God, these, these thoughts that just come and come and come and, you know, they're relentless. And at some point, just being sick of them, you know, just being like, okay, we just gotta, whoosh. it's like the sense of like, it doesn't have to be out of anger. It doesn't have to be out of aversion to the thoughts, but of just a sense of relief of, of giving the heart some room to breathe, to feel what might be the emotions underneath these weeds of thought and, and start to attend to what's actually underneath them in a deeper way seeing that the weeds of, of mind keep us from actually getting to this deeper level into the soil uh, of the heart, of understanding these regenerative processes that are happening in the mind and body. So there is something about that, you know, and that it feels good to bring something back, you know, some sense of restoring, some sense of repairing. Um, on whatever many levels that may end up being. And yet, how to do that also without the sense of attachment, right? Without a too much fixation on, oh, this is what the outcome is going to look like. This is what we're going to do. This is where we're going to grow. This is how it's all going to, you know, how we're going to pay for it. And here's who's going to come. And it's just like, no, we don't know the outcome of the heart. We don't know what's going to happen with this low E. It feels good to do what we're doing. We want to take care, right? Malama, this land. The spirits there, our community, you know, what's what's being called for. And I think with our our own agendas, with our hearts and minds, I think sometimes they can also be very violent, you know, too fixated on uh, where we think we're going, what we think we're trying to create, what our idea of what the enlightened mind might be. And, and, and not listening to the deepest truth with this, that it will all get destroyed at some point. Whether, you know, a tsunami comes or Hawaii ends up under the ocean or we all just die and, you know, someone else bulldozes it, which happens, right? It's happened plenty here, more than the opposite. Uh, how do we how do we also have some peace with that some sense of like our our efforts and the our connection to the goodness of our efforts isn't um diminished by a total acknowledgement and reckoning with our uncontrollability of the future of the outcomes it's a very um very difficult thing for all of us in our work and our lives we want to have some faith that the goodness of our actions will amount to something, will will create good, will be significant. And I think that, you know, well, we can have that and we should. There, there has to be some acknowledgement of the truth that, of course, actions based in goodness and in generosity and care will create more goodness and generosity and care, will have good outcomes, that our actions do matter and matter far beyond us, you know, and, and beyond a way we can measure. But there also has to be, I think in this path and this practice, what can feel like the contradictory truth, which is that everything we do will amount to nothing. We, 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 it doesn't matter, actually. You're, you're like, there, there, there will be no, monument that doesn't fall. Uh, there has to be some peace with our entire and utter lack of importance also. And how, how the heart can hold both of those things to be true is a lot to do with our practice. Um, but if it's not, if we don't also accept the the, the inevitability that all things will come to an end, uh, that it means that our actions are gonna be tainted, even our generosity or our goodness, there's a little grasping, there's this, this taintedness there that's, um, that affects the action and the results of the action, but also affects our heart. 
And I think there's something about that humility in our own practice lives as well, not just in our work or our families or the things we want to have instilled in the future generations when we're gone that, you know, we can feel good about. There's also the part um, of the future that we have uh, that has no stake in us. And um, can we feel that as a relief also? Is there a place where it's the kind of surrender and acceptance of the inevitability of death, uh, the inevitability of the coming to end of things, um, that is also a peace, that is a relief, not just a stress or not just uh, a kind of harsh renunciation? This is the Udaya Sutta. In Savati, the Blessed One, putting on his robes in the morning and taking a bowl and robes, approached the Brahmin Udaya's house. The Brahmin Udaya filled the Blessed One's bowl with rice. For a second day, the Blessed One, putting on his robes in the morning and taking his bowl, approached the Brahman Udaya's house. The Brahman Udaya filled the Blessed One's bowl with rice. For a third day, the Blessed One, putting on robes in the morning and taking a bowl and robes, approached the Brahman Udaya's house. The Brahman Udaya filled the Blessed One's bowl with rice and said, It's annoying. This recluse Gotama comes again and again. <laughs> and the Blessed One said, Again and again, the seeds are sown. Again and again, the rain comes down. Again and again, the farmers till the field. Again and again, food is provided for the country. Again and again, the benevolent give. Again and again, Giving gifts, the benevolent, again and again, procure a place in heaven. Again and again, one tires and throbs. Again and again, the fool enters the womb. Again and again, someone is born and someone dies. Again and again, someone is carried to the grave. Gaining the path, some are not born again. The wise are not born again and again. And of course, the Brahman Udaya said, good Gotama, now I understand. It's like something overturned is put upright. Something covered is made manifest. It's like one who is lost is shown the path. It's like a lamp lighted for the darkness, for those who have sight to see forms. In this and other ways, the teaching is well explained. Now I take refuge in the good Gotama, in the teaching, the community of bhikkhus. I am a lay disciple who's taken refuge from today until I die. I think there's something um, so important in this acknowledgement of the relentlessness of our experience, even our good experience, you know, even our generosity and, you know, the sense of like, yes, again and again, the benevolent give and again and again, the farmers till the soil again and again, they produce food for the land, you know, again and again, these benevolent people, you know, they get their place in heaven and <laughs> right. He's like, but that's not, there's still something exhausting about that. You know, there's still, it's still just this like relentlessness that's going. Uh, the sense of um, the relentlessness isn't just because of greed, right? Or uh, hatred. It's, it's like, actually, we can be doing all of these good things, but we have to actually get weary of the uh, process. There has to be some sense of um, disenchantment with what we're gaining, right? It's like, oh, we're clearing the fields, we're clearing the mine, we're weeding, we're doing all these things. But there is a place where these metaphors um, fail, 
right? Where there is some sense of like, where do we also acknowledge the energy and the effort and the striving it takes to keep producing ourselves, to keep reproducing ourselves, to keep reproducing the world uh, internally and externally. And where is there any place of this relief of like, and it's through, through the acknowledgement of the relentlessness of it, of the constant coming to birth and dying, uh, whether it's through lifetimes in the sort of more mystical sense or just in this momentary way. You know, I think as yogis, I, every, almost every person, you know, I've spoken with them the last few days, there, there is this amazing way in which I think being on retreat at home, it's this inundation of responsibility is something we're, we're very aware of, very sensitive to. It's like, oh, okay, another, got to cook breakfast again, got to clean up for breakfast again. Oh, there's another doorbell ringing. Oh, there's another person I have to deal with. And it's like, there's always this sense of like, well, once this thing is over and then I'll get to where I'm going and then I'll get to where I'm going. But it's like, you see that there's this like leaning into the future right? We're sort of anchoring our happiness into some future moment and trying to kind of cleave ourselves there, right? Or we've tethered ourselves to the past, right? To some, a past moment and that we live in this sort of strain between the present and the past. It's, it's a lot of what the self is, is this tension, this experience of tension between striving forward and clawing backwards and the relentlessness of the responsibility to keep showing up, to keep showing up. And it's not just the hardness, you know, people again are coming to, it's like, it's not just in the Buddha spoke of the kinds of dukkha, you know, there's the dukkha dukkha, the, the when unpleasant experiences were joined with, you know, something unpleasant happens in the body and the mind and the world and our heart, our sense experiences. It's the joining with that, which is unpleasant or the being separated from that, which is pleasant, anicca dukkha that which we love, that's what we care for is, is, you know, dies or dissipates. And then there's the Sankara Dukkha, just the suffering of just the relentlessness. It's like, oh my God, every moment, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, every moment, loba doha mosa, right? Every moment, just like me, 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 this, 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 that, 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 something to tend to, something to deal with, something to, you know, it's like the relentlessness of life again and again, again and again, again and again. And what is, you know, what is our response? What is our relationship? Where do we use these tools to, to watch it closely and see where do we take responsibility for our part in the reproduction, our part in coming back into being each moment, to re-selfing ourselves to what is called in the tradition, becoming, bhava, right? This very subtle way, uh, kind of like a little, you know, related to what Steve Saito was telling Steve, uh, he mentioned in his talk around like where are you just sort of like leaning into something inclining towards something where are you kind of moving away it's the sense of these very subtle force in the mind during our practice which is just like often it's just a little bit leaning in it's like the next moment is where we're going to get it the next moment is where we're going to get it we're almost there there's something right around the bend and it's this like it's like that that the impulse of the mind, that is what creates this process of becoming, of asserting the self into the future. And it's, of course, it's also this response to just the insecurity of the constant flow of experience, the instability, the relentlessness of that. Uh, but there are these moments where the mind is strong enough and, and everyone has these moments here, you know, this, these moments where it's like, okay, I actually don't, I can sit in this. I can sit under this waterfall and for even just a few seconds, just be with it, be with the inundation feel the intensity of the wanting or the not wanting and pull back that projection. Not as the, it's not about the object, the wanting of the object, the hating of the object. It's like, can we just feel the wanting? Can we feel the hatred? Can we feel the confusion, right? The overwhelm without uh, grasping or rejecting. You know, there are these moments where we can bear it, but it takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of concentration and mindfulness, all these beautiful qualities that we're cultivating to simply be in the stream of experience without reconjuring ourselves into the next. 
And then of course, you know, part of that dhamma of, of watching the fourth foundation of mindfulness is trying to understand, wow, why, what is the impulse of the mind to always be leaning into the future? You know, to always be grasping, to always be reaching for something, some future state of satisfaction. Right? And where do we have the courage and the peace and the acceptance of feeling like, oh, we may never be satisfied of the truth of that, that there actually is no satisfaction of sense experience. There are moments of pleasure that can be a relief, definitely, and will encourage folks to, you know, this isn't just meant to be ascetic practice where you're not allowing yourself any pleasure and you're just, you know, super strict about anything. It's like, that isn't this way. It is the middle way, you know, this understanding that there are, there are places for neutral, for the buoyancy of mind that some uh, wholesome pleasure can bring so that we feel like we can face it, you know. It's the role in a large part also of the Brahma Viharas, of loving kindness, of compassion, of appreciative joy, of equanimity. It's like that grinding, grinding, grinding of sharpening. You know, all, all, all sharpening, you need some kind of lubricant, right? The, the, the steel will get too hot. It will start to, um, you know, it won't sharpen well. It'll ruin the blade if you don't have oil or water or something that, that makes that smoother, that doesn't feel like it's creating just heat by that process. And so where do we soothe the mind, soothe the heart, soothe the body? through love, through that coolness of equanimity, of accepting things as they are, of accepting our death, accepting the death of others, accepting the imperfection of creation and the ultimate imperfection of all phenomena. Where do we really understand that these the practices of love and wisdom are entirely integrated, that we can't really do one without the other. We can't have that acceptance in a true way uh, that's still connected without the love, right? Without the true honest caring for all of life and all of creation. But at the same time, that caring doesn't mean we see the limits of caring to control, right? The care doesn't mean we can make things how we want them to be. And we accept that all things are dependent upon the conditions which cause them to arise. And when those conditions change, they will pass away. They will change. It is this uh, practice of being born and dying every moment, you know, and it's hard to fathom and hard to take that intensely and that seriously all the time. But it is really what this practice is. And to remember, it, it is why we're training in this particular way, you know, to watch, uh, you know, this, to go, the reason we go slowly, it's like, do we have the patience to try to track our karma as it's unfolding, right? It's like every mental volition, moment of mental volition has an impact. You know, it has an impact in the body, it has an impact in the mind. And it's like, can we go slow enough to see it? Can we be moving slow enough to really, how fast can you really take a step and watch your, the, the results of your actions unfold? Uh, how, how, how quickly can you really watch chewing, swallowing? You know, it doesn't mean we need to be as, you know, in total slow-mo all day long. You know, it'll, it can be unbearable. Um, at times, it can be a relief to sort of explore, you know, at different paces and, and, and check out like, wow, what, what is the possibility of attention at this pace? What is the possibility of attention at, at this other pace? But to understand there is a reason why we encourage that slowing down, you know, especially 
at home or, you know, it's like your responsibilities may largely not be that, the timing of them may not be that important if you're not just thinking about getting to the next sitting, but just taking your time with each thing. You know, it's, it's humbling to see really how, how slowly we really need to move in order to be able to actually watch the impact of our mind on the body, the impact of the body and the mind on the world around us. I got um, very sick this spring. Um, it wasn't like a normal kind of sickness. Um, but I, there were times where I really was very clear that it was the, the most ill I had ever been. And um, it was the kind of thing where I just, it, it, I could see how limited my perspective was as someone born in this era of um, that sort of arrogance of health and the assumption that most of the time when I get sick, I have felt like it will pass or that there will be some medicine or some treatment that can be to take care of it. And that that really getting that, of course, for many people that is still not true, um, but that for most of human history, that really hasn't been true. That getting sick, I think probably for, you know, a lot of human history, getting a little cut, you know, could very much be a, a mortal experience, right? Um, because of infections and lack of medicine and, um, the reality of that. And I think that there was something of coming back into this, like the broader flow of human experience of really understanding that all of our, my assumptions around, and even with my own training and knowing that death can happen at any time, uh, this, this humbling way in which I was faced with that, that starkness of really just not knowing and knowing that you really could, you know, there is no guarantee that you'll be 70 or 80 or 90 and like, you know, 41 could be it. And um, something rather actually kind of beautiful in that <laughs> of just like uh, coming back into that, f that deeper channel, ri the river of, of human and just animal uh, experience on this planet and yet of course scary and and very difficult and um and bewildering this 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 reality of getting that it's not just that i am I'm afraid of dying it's that there's like a, such a total uh, unknown you know that i feel like i can watch the rising and falling of the breath or i can watch you know, when the concentration is good and the conditions are there, the arising and passing of a thought. But the idea of like a whole life ending and and not with that same sense of assumptive guarantee that I've had with my breath or with a thought that there will be a next one, right? Um, was was very powerful. And, and I could also see that it was a misconception that of course the experience of dying isn't going to be of a whole life dying. The experience is still going to be in a momentary experience of a breath or a thought or an itch or, you know, a memory or a fantasy. It's, it's all still going to happen in a momentary way. Um, 
but that sense of when when are we aware that we're at the end? Um, I had been reading uh, a great book collection of um, Japanese death poems uh, that was um, really wonderful and mind boggling. Um, Cause I was always, I've been curious about that of like, you have the sense that sometimes people really know they're going to die whether they're ill or whether they're well, and just sort of very curious about that quality of mind um, and aware that I this spring I did not get there, but I had more sense of like, oh, okay, you could, I could, I can imagine that now in a way that I couldn't have even six months ago of, of that sense of like, oh, this, this isn't gonna get better. Um, and it's a long tradition in Japan uh, of, from, you know, um, not just Buddhist, but Shinto and beyond, you know, like of, of these um, compositions when someone is dying. And there's a whole spectrum of them that are quite powerful and beautiful. Um, we have time, I'll just, I'll read a couple. It lights up as lightly as it fades, a firefly. That was Chine, who died at 28 in 1688. This is uh, Chogo in 1806, who was 45. I long for people, then again, I loathe them. End of autumn. Chora, who was 54 in 1776. The drone of the mosquitoes around the netting too is sad. I, I was surprised to just see the honesty of some of these, you know, they weren't all just like enlightenment poems of, of showing how at peace they were with their final moments of really being honest about the sadness. Uh, or the bitterness, you know, and that sense of like, oh, I long for people and then I loathe them. <laughs> and and that feels maybe more realistic for some of our last moments, you know, than just like, I think this aspiration we have of like, oh, that's where we're just gonna shine. You know, our death is just gonna be where it all, we pull it off, you know? And it's like, I don't know. I'm not sure that's the best expectation from just, just the sense even of myself this spring of like, God, you know, probably we're going to be like really sick and exhausted and it might be very hard to have any precision with the mind, you know, and what does that mean? What do we, how do we, how do we, um, how do we hold our responsibility of mindfulness in a different way when there's no energy, when there's so much physical pain, you know, do we also take on the lessons of like, well, actually, what have we trained ourselves in? You know, are we forcing ourselves? Are we maybe trying to show up for it, but also giving ourselves the relief. Where's the compassion and the tenderness for ourselves in those moments as well? Inseki was 67 in 1765, he wrote, I give my name back as I step in this Eden of flowers. Isho, from deep in my heart, how beautiful the snow clouds in the West. Isa was a very famous poet at 65 in 1827 wrote, from one basin to another, stuff and nonsense. And I think one of the ones that had the most impact on me was um, this guy, Narushima Chuhashiro, who, what it became clear is like, most people weren't writing these at the moment of their death, actually, right? They're writing them because it's a thing that people do. And so they would prepare 
uh, for them. And so this guy, he was terrified that he was going to die without writing his death poem at like 50 something. And so he, he just wrote like tons and tons of death poems and drafts and he would send them to his teacher, uh, Reze uh, Tameyasu, who was also like a very well-respected poet for like correction. And, and so when he was 80, <laughs> 80, he's been writing death poems for 30 years. So he's a, he, he writes this poem. For 80 years and more, by the grace of my sovereign and my parents, I have lived with a tranquil heart between the flowers and the moon. And so he sent this poem to his teacher and his only reply of correction said, when you reach 90, correct the first line. <laughs> And so I think there is something really to that of like, how much do we think about maybe our death or the future? You know, it's like, whether it's our positive future or the end of our lives, how much energy do we expend kind of like fantasizing and projecting our hopes and fears onto these last moments or last weeks or last months? And where do we honestly take that training of really seeing that it's like, it, there, there really is no guarantee in every moment, right? With the rising and falling of the breath. And to really, are we really willing to be that scared by watching the breath? To show the fear of that, the, the total insecurity, the instability, that, that no matter how high the breath rises, it will amount to nothing. It's going to fall again. It's going to disappear. How long those gaps in between the breath last can be very frightening as a yogi, right? There's these moments where it's like, it goes. And then there's like, there's this space, you know? And it's very common to like have this contraction of the heart of like, oh, we, something's wrong. And, and the, mind, the mind pulls sort of stuff together because it's like, how long can that space last before the sense of non-being is terrifying, right? Are we scared of it? And it's like, it's okay. That's where the compassion comes in. Feeling that sense of, of course, of course we're compelled to reassert ourselves, to project ourselves into the future, to, to regather the energy, to insist upon the next rising um, and to follow that, that, that path. But to really know that, you know, you're, you're all in this place now where there's enough strength of mind, there's enough continuity of practice where you can get to that level of honesty with each moment of experience, right? Where it's not just, you know, sort of road and mundane where it's like, you can let go a little bit of the assumptions around the future, start to be sensitive to the ways in which, oh, there is still this like, it's still leaning in to the future. There's still this generation of myself becoming uh, that's happening. Can we be interested in it? Where do we feel relaxed enough to not need to become again? What kind of flavor of freedom is that? What a different quality of happiness that might be. Hold ourselves in our hearts, you know, capable uh, of that kind of sensitivity and honor that longing, honor the place where we're attached to becoming and we're also exhausted by it. We don't need to just live our lives as if one is the true or the other, but this sense of like, actually the only way we get to truly love and truly love our lives and those in our lives is when we also are disenchanted, right? by the expectation that we're clinging to of what's next, of what's happening next, of what's, what's gonna come of us. And that this is a, a powerful dance of how they support each other and also unbind one another um, from their shadows. So just, you know, that, that re remember that piece of like the, the part of this practice, it's not just 
always getting more and more precise. It's like this dexterity of mind of we learn that the attention can be so sharp and so precise and so subtle and so dexterous at times when the conditions are there. And then there's plenty of times where the conditions are not there and the attention can be much more general. That's what I found for myself this spring. It's like I didn't have the energy to explore. I couldn't be face to face with the terror or the dullness or the unknowing all the time, you know, uh, the, 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 the incredible the vulnerability of having your body not working and the not being able to breathe, uh, you know, that, that like, I was so glad that I could have an anchor outside of the body, that I had trained in that, that I had trained with sound, where I didn't need to be forcing the attention into that, which was so evocative, right? Uh, and that I had, it's like, oh, loving kindness, mm, all of these things felt too intense, too generative, but it was actually the equanimity practice that I felt like, oh, I could settle into. It's like, okay, I'm the owner of my actions. You know, if this is the, if this is, this is what has come of a long, long, mysterious line of action. This is where it's, this is where it's led. Can I accept that? Yes. You know, there was a relief in that to feel like maybe you can't always watch the precise subtle sensations of each moment of pressure and tension and tingling and, you know, in the body, but you can know there is a body. You know, that's very clear in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha says, or just knowing there is a body is like good enough. And not just good enough, but good practice. That like we're learning to narrow the attention, open the attention, move it here, move it there, make it warmer, make it cooler, all with the training that ultimately we have this total flexibility, this dexterity of the tool that can naturally will attend to whatever experience arises because that's the training. We've trained enough in this vast range of joy and sorrow, experience in the body and the mind, that these are the intuitive, natural responses that happens, liberated, unattached, kind, clear, patient, tender. So let's just sit for a few moments. Again and again, the seeds are sown. Again and again, the rain comes down. Again and again, the farmers till the field. Again and again, food is provided for the country. Again and again, the benevolent give. Again and again, the benevolent giving gifts. Again and again, procure a place in heaven. Again and again, one tires and throbs. Again and again, the fool enters the womb. Again and again, someone is born and dies. Again and again, someone is carried to the grave. Gaining the path, some are not born again. The wise are not born again and again. have a good period of uh, walking or chores or whatever. And I'll see you in a little while for the method chant. Let's sit. 